Welcome to another episode of the Rocks of Utah. My name is Benjamin Berger. I'm a geologist here in Utah. And in this episode of the Rocks of Utah, we're exploring the Permian Cedar Mesa Sandstone. So behind me is one of the natural bridges that makes up Natural Bridges National Monument. And it's formed in the Cedar Mesa, this late Permian massive sandstone that forms uh, basically this giant mesa in southeastern Utah. And rivers and creeks have cut through uh, these canyons. And in certain places, they have cut through and formed arches. These arches form slightly different than the arches that are found in Arches National Park up in Moab. These are actually formed by rivers cutting through them in these canyons, and they're massive. These are some of the largest ar arches in the world, and they're found here in Utah. So this arch is Sapua, is the name of this arch. And these arches actually were discovered by uh, many of the Pueblo Indians that were living here at the time. And some of the Shoshone and Paiute Indians uh, knew about this place. And uh, they brought in a white, uh, some white explorers in the 1880s. 1883, I think, was the first uh, written documentation of these natural bridges. But this place has actually been inhabited uh, for a very long time. In fact, there's structures that we pass through that these were canyons that were um, actually a fairly cosmopolitan city uh, just about a, th about a thousand years ago. So here is one of these mudstones um, that we can see that's eroded in, and that helps to provide you know, a nice shelter, um, some shade on these hot, sunny days. And you can actually see some, some uh, dwellings down there that were built. And what's really neat about this is that this chocolatey brown mudstone is indicating that things were wet at certain periods of time. These are great places to look for fossils. And then we have these dry Aeolian deposits, uh, wind-blown sand that's on top and below us. So these are the little lenses that would erode out and create these wonderful cliff faces uh, that dot uh, White Canyon and around Cedar Mesa. So here's one of the uh, surface in one of these mudstones showing a lot of this bioturbation. Little organisms going along, moving around the mud. You can see them right here, wiggling around in this mud. So there's life here. So here's some ripples that are in the step in the path. These are really wonderful um, symmetrical ripples, which indicate they're probably uh, along a beach. So. This might have come from a little bit above, maybe the Oregon rock formation, but um, indicating, you know, we're really close to the ocean at this time. You see these wonderful, wonderful ripple marks. These places are really special, I think, and I love exploring these areas in southeastern Utah. So I'm up here um, basically on a mesa called Cedar Mesa, and this is the White Canyon, um, and I'm standing on the Cedar Mesa uh, sandstone, which is a Permian rock layer. And I wanted to point out um, the contact with the unit above it. Um, so this is Permian rocks down here, but those red beds that are over on the other side of the canyon, those are Triassic rocks. So the, these rocks bracket the Permian-Triassic boundary. The lower rocks down here are the Moenkopi, uh, which is um, fairly early in the uh, Triassic, and then the rocks that they're sitting on top of is uh, Permian. And this has been interpreted as a, a major erosional surface up here between the shift between the Cedar Mesa sandstone, uh, which is part of the Cutler group, a Permian group, and then the next series of rock layers, which is the Moenkopi and Chinli, which are Triassic in age. There's some people standing there. 
up there. And so we can zoom out and see how giant this canyon is. It's really large. The scale of things out here. So you know how arches form. One arch meets another arch and pretty soon there's little baby arches everywhere. A super tiny little arch. So this is kind of cool. This is really neat. So I came to a little area in the Cedar Mesa and I'm finding this type of rock here, which is a limestone. It's got a little uh, calcium carbonate in it. And that's what's causing this weird sort of alien-like uh, erosion pattern. And they've lined the, the trail with it, which is cool. Uh, yeah, so this is probably like a little lake, um, some a little aquatic area inside this very warm desert. Uh, maybe a little oasis at some point back then. I love exploring these places in southeastern Utah. <laughs> Such an amazing, neat place to go exploring in. And uh, there are miles and miles of these canyons. And they're filled with really wonderful geological treasures, amazing archaeological sites. So look at these wonderful Aeolian cross bedding. Just spectacular Aeolian cross bedding here. You can see these wonderful lineations. These big huge troughs sweeping across and then getting cross-cutted by another set of cross beds. Very indicative of sand dunes. So this is an ancient sand sea, called an erg, E-R-G. But in, in our space with these, we fee, see these limestones and mudstones, it's these little oasises. And that's where you find the fossils and you find evidence that even though this is a vast desert, there was life in it. Just like, kind of like today, I guess. <laughs> Kind of understand a little bit now why <laughs> maybe so many people called this their home a thousand years ago. It's just really beautiful. It's a beautiful place. You get down in these canyons and it's nice and cool and there's water. You know, out here in the desert. And uh, they are little oases in these canyons. I love the shapes that all these rocks make with the sky above. Typical landscapes are, you know, a river cutting through a forest. In Utah, the landscape, it like, it like becomes part of the sky. So all sorts of wonderful shapes appear when suddenly the sky is below the landscape. It's such a surreal, wonderful landscape. One of the interesting things reading up on the Cedar Mesa sandstone uh, was that there's, there was actually a, quite a bit of debate on the depositional environment that this represented. Um, because in many ways, it looks like Aeolian sand dunes but also it has these kind of features that make it look like it's a, it's a more wet environment. So, but I think what the agreement right now is that it kind of alternates between the two. So it was these sand dunes and then occasionally there'd be like fluvial, like rivers and streams and ponds that would form uh, during 
certain periods of time when it was a little bit wetter and the climate was changing just a slightly differently. So this is kind of a neat little little feature. Um, you can see all these crystals, these white crystals, which is probably mostly calcium carbonate that is deposited kind of like like somebody spray painted a bunch of this these crystals up here. And what this is, is this is this, um, where you had an aquifer and you had groundwater that was moving through this. Probably in the springtime it would move through it. And it would trickle out of these rocks at this point. This is one of those contacts with a mudstone and so it's a weak spot in the rocks. And so groundwater is going to flow through this, especially with the snow melt off in the springtime. And so the water is going to come trickling through here and as it's doing it's carrying a lot of uh, calcium carbonate, a lot of salts and stuff. And when it gets to the surface on this hot rock it's going to start evaporating out and so that leaves, that precipitates out all of this salt um, which is a lot in calcium carbonate, any minerals that was dissolved in the, in the rock or in the water as it's moving through the rock. So here's the mudstone that eroded out and then eventually it eroded out through there and formed an arch. So I found something really cool over here behind this stone here. I'm just going to point it out. got to be careful here. I'm going to turn the camera around. This is really cool. This is a granary. Right here you can see the mud that they've piled up here between the stones. And uh, they have the slab here. They're probably using it to hide something. Let's go around the other side and see if we can see inside of it. Yeah, it looks like it's collapsed. Oh wait, I see what they're hiding in there. In fact, let me zoom in. I'll show you. It's very cool. See that right there? Is a corn cob. Probably a thousand year old corn cob. <laughs> that is very cool. Look at that right there. But that's the greenery. So I'm up here um, along Combe Ridge, which is this huge ridge that extends throughout east southeastern Utah. Um, composed mostly of Jurassic rocks. In fact, these rocks behind me are some of the Jurassic Navajo and Nugget sandstones uh, that you see, the same rock layers that you see up in Arches National Monument. But I want to talk about what makes this particular area along Combe Ridge and over in Cita Mesa and south um, so special. And that is, is that there's some amazing uh, archaeological areas out here. Uh, these are some cliff dwelling houses that are here that date to the, uh, the 11th century um, built out here in the desert. Uh, there's actually uh, four kivas inside this structure, which are these round houses, these big, huge round areas. They, uh, they are kind of like uh, equivalent to great houses or, or uh, social areas where people would meet, kind of like our modern day living rooms. Uh, there's actually kind of what's really neat about this, this structure that it's got four. One of them is a square one, which is kind of unique in this area. Most of them are round, uh, like you find over in Colorado um, uh, in Mesa Verde. But uh, some beautiful and wonderful structures along Combe Ridge. In 1906, the Antiquities Act was passed by Congress to give the power to the United States President, the executive branch of government, to establish areas of land uh, to manage as national monuments uh, with the intention of preserving the cultural and historical significant features of that land for future generations. And here in Utah we have 
lots of very ancient ruins um, and places that have very deep historical significance. Uh, th these uh, Pueblo uh, ruins up here uh, were built about a thousand years ago in the 11th century. Um, and there's four kivas um, inside these cliff dwellings. You can see some uh, buildings over here uh, that were occupied. So there's this really long history of human occupation in Utah. Um, and so monument monumental status uh, should be designated to areas that are like this, that have really wonderful cultural and historical significance. This act was first utilized by President Theodore Roosevelt in Utah with his designation of the Natural Bridges National Monument in 1908. However, however his designation um, of natural bridges did not protect many of the cultural sensitive lands surrounding the area, including uh, Cedar Mesa, Valley of the Gods, Dark Canyon Wilderness Area, Comb Ridge, where I'm at now with all these cliff houses, as well as Bears Ears. These areas were managed by either the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, or the Forest Service. So with a presidential proclamation on December 28, 2016, Bears Ears National Monument was formed with the support of the four Indian tribes in Utah, as well as many locals in Utah, um, to extend the protection um, outside of natural bridges uh, into the surrounding region. However, less than a year later, a uh, newly elected president rescinded that status um, with another presidential pro proclamation uh, without any authority from the United States Congress. Um, and so these lands returned to being managed by the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service. Now, the Bureau of Land Management is actually an outgrowth of the Land Grants Office that was formed way back when, um, early on during the Mexican-American War, and also when land was taken away from Native American tribes uh, and the process of establishing reservations in certain key areas, moving people around the American West. And so the Bureau of Land Management has a long history of sort of allocating land to certain uses, especially economic uses, rather than necessarily functioning as a uh, park, as a area of preservation. Um, so they don't have the staff uh, that you would find in the Park Service to have much funding for doing archaeological and educational sort of things for many of these culturally sensitive areas in, in the United States. The other thing about revoking that monumental status is that it broke up many of the ties that the federal government was establishing with many of the sovereign uh, Indian nations um, in Utah, uh, including you know, the Navajo, the Diné, uh, the Pueblo Indians, the Hopi, the Ute, um, and many of these Indian groups that had been separated and forced onto reservations, the establishment of this monument was a cooperative establishment to tie people back to their ancestral areas and also tie back uh, their own cultural significance to this region. They can be easily um, poached, easily looted, easily vandalized, and so having that extra layer of protection for these regions is really important. And that comes from funding. So the biggest thing about monumental status is that there's more funding for protecting places like this than there is when it's managed by the BLM or the Forest Service. There's just not as many people managing the area and the budget's quite a bit smaller than allocated for the Park Service. So this land is no longer managed by an agency that's prime um, purpose is for the preservation of these places. Um, the BLM is about the economic interest of, of the land and basically parceling that out, leasing out the land. And so revoking that monumental status uh, endangers the land to other economic uses other than the preservation of some of these amazing archaeological sites. You know, these areas need to be protected, but that to do that, we need to sort of designate these lands for preservation and the importance of that. And I think that we need to put more funding 
whether it's managed by the Park Service, whether it's managed by the Bureau of Land Management, more funding for the protection of these areas. And working a lot more with locals, uh, particularly working with Indian tribes, and making sure they have access to many of these ancestral areas that, that are their home, you know. So I think the most important thing I think about this is that it may not seem like a big deal that the land is either managed by one bureaucracy or another bureaucracy. But I think what really matters is how we view the land. Do we view the land as a place that needs to be preserved and protected, as a land that can educate us and teach us valuable lessons about our planet? And I think that that's really, really important. Um, and I think that too often, especially government agencies, large corporations, see the land as how can we make money off this land? And I think we need to start looking at the land more as, as we do our homes, more of a very important place, a, a spiritual place. And I think by designating these areas and having them managed by the Park Service with consultation and with cooperation of various Indian tribes, that this area can be a very spiritual and very important place for the people of Utah and for the many Native American tribes who have for centuries called this land their home. And so I think that's really important. And I think it also sends a message of protecting these areas. So if you'd like to help um, with the National Monument status of Bears Ears, I have an organization that I'm gonna include a link to below. If you'd like to contribute to a lot of people trying to fight for the reestablishment of Bears Ears National Monument. So be sure to send some support over their way.